All right, let's see. Well, can you give me an update as soon as you can? Great. Uh, well, welcome. We're incredibly excited to talk more about the BFR rocket and announce the first uh, private astronaut, first uh, a private citizen that's going to go into deep space. And uh, I'm going to start off with just uh, talking a bit about uh, BFR and you know, kind of how we got to this point. So the, the, the purpose of SpaceX, the reason for, the, for creating SpaceX was to accelerate the advent of humanity becoming a spacefaring civilization to help advance rocket technology to the point where we could potentially become a multi-planet species and a, and a true space-bearing civilization. So, <clears throat> it, as we consider sort of the, 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 the fossil record, the history of civilization, it's important to bear in mind like there could be some natural event or some man-made event that ends civilization as we know it and or in life as we know it and so it's important that we try to become a multi-planet civilization extend life beyond earth um, and to do so as quickly as we can that that window of opportunity may be open for a long time or it may be open for a short time but we should not assume that it is open for a long time we should take action um, and, and become a multi-planet civilization as soon as possible. And that, that's kind of like the, 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 like the defensive reason. I, I wonder, do you want to emphasize it's, it's, it's multi-planetary, not um, single planet, but somewhere else. Um, we want to become a multi-planet civilization, um, have uh, life on, on Mars, Moon, maybe Venus, the moons of Jupiter, uh, throughout the solar system and then ultimately extend life beyond the solar system to other star systems. And I think that's the future that's incredibly exciting. I think that's the future that we, that we want. And you know, there's, there's so many things that make people sad or depressed about the future, but I think becoming a space-faring civilization is one of those things that makes you excited about the future, makes you excited to get up in the morning. Like, this is something that you can look forward to um, that makes you glad to be a human being. I, you know, I, ho I hope that, that, that people will see it that way. That is, that is, what the, that is the intent of, of BFR, um, is to make people excited about the future. So this is sort of an illustration of what it would be like on Mars, Mars base. And I want to talk about it, it will show you, like this is where we were 10 years ago. So we're almost at the 10th anniversary of, the, of SpaceX's first flight to orbit. So that was 2008. Yeah, September 2008. It's the first time we made orbit. And we'd had three attempts before that that did not succeed. That's well, hot in here. So we. <clears throat> So we'd had three attempts to reach orbit, and then the fourth one, the fourth attempt reached orbit in September 2008. And if we had not reached orbit on that attempt, the SpaceX would, no, would not exist. So that was the, the fourth and final uh, att uh, possibility of reaching orbit. So that was a very, very tough launch emotionally. Um, but fortunately, we, that, that launch did make it to orbit. And then not long after that, we, we won our first um, really major NASA contract, or we won the space station servicing contract. And that was, those were two things that were instrumental in SpaceX's success. 
Then that brings us to where we were earlier this year, which is the launch of Falcon Heavy. So we went from Falcon 1 being just a little rocket that could uh, launch only half a ton to low Earth orbit and it had no reusability to Falcon Heavy, which is the most powerful rocket in the world by a factor of two, um, with enough payload to orbit capability to put a fully loaded 737 passengers pool, uh, passengers fuel and, and luggage into orbit. And we were able to launch um, sort of a fun payload, uh, which is, you know, a Tesla Roadster with a sort of a Starman mannequin to Mars orbit. So we were able to, to launch a, a, a quite a heavy payload to Mars orbit and bring the, the two side boosters back and land them back at Cape Canaveral. Um, the center core that didn't land successfully, but we'll be able to do that, we think, in, in a subsequent launch. But it, it's a, it is a massive change over the course of 10 years to go from just barely being able to get to orbit to the most powerful launch vehicle in the world by a factor of two, to have a full reusability of the, of the boost stage. Um, we've now done missions where there's, we've launched the boost stage several times, uh, which is like quite, quite great. And then we've been able to re refly our Dragon spacecraft. So it's an enormous change over the course of 10 years. And I think there were, if, you, if you say, like, OK, <clears throat> how many people predicted um, in 2008 that SpaceX would have done these things by 2018? I think zero. That's my, I think zero. Like, I'm not sure it's zero, but I'm, I, I'm not aware of anyone who had made that prediction, including me, by the way. I would have said this is unlikely. Um, nonetheless, in 10 years, we got from tiny rockets barely making it to orbit to world's biggest rocket by far with reusable boost stages and sending a car to Mars. Um, by the way, a lot of people don't understand like, why we sent a car to Mars. Obviously, that's a bit confusing. Why would you send a car to Mars? That's bizarre. Um, but the, the real reason was we wanted to just have something that was fun and that people could identify with. And you know, normally, when a company creates a new rocket, they like just launch like a slab of concrete or something. And I was like, well, that's pretty boring. So um, we wanted something that was, that was fun and that felt like you could maybe be there. And that's, that was like the reasoning behind the car and, and the astronaut in the car. Um, that was a tribute to David Bowie and um, the Hitchhiker's Hitch Hitch Guide to the Galaxy and a few other things. Um, and, and there's also like the, the Asimov Foundation series etched, etched in glass on, in the glove compartment. So that's, uh, in fact, Asimov's uh, Foundation series is a, a key inspiration for SpaceX. So just an update on BFR itself. So the design, uh, the, the production design of BFR is different in some important ways from the, what I presented about a year ago. Um, overall, it is 118 meters long. Uh, the payload is still is similar. It's about 100 uh, metric tons. Uh, that's 100 metric tons to, well, actually, technically 100 metric tons to all the way to Mars because of orbital, uh, orbital refueling or, or orbital, orbital retanking. So um, BFR is able to, is designed to be able to take 100 tons all the way to the surface of Mars or to any, well, surface of Mars, maybe Ceres, but, but if you have a, a, a propellant depot on Mars, you're able to get from Mars to the asteroid belt to uh, the moons of Jupiter and kind of like planet and moon hop all the way to the outer solar system. So BFR is really intended as um, an interplanetary transport system that's capable of getting um, from Earth to anywhere in, in the solar system um, as you establish propellant depots along the way.
Yeah. So we, we've um, increased the payload section to be over 1,000 cubic meters. I think it'll probably end up being probably so, something around 1,100 cubic meters. <clears throat> there are um, forward actuated fins and rear actuated fins. The, the way that BFR flies is somewhat counterintuitive. If you apply the sort of normal intuition, it, it will not make sense. Um, I'll try to illustrate that in this presentation. So there's the two forward actuated flaps, and then there are two rear actuated wings or fins or flaps, depending on what they're not exactly comparable to anything else out there. Um, but you, you kind of want you want, kind of want four control surfaces to to be able to control the vehicle through a wide range of atmospheric densities and and velocities. So the it, the the way it operates is kind of more like a skydiver than an, than an aircraft. Uh, al almost the entire time when it's re-entering, it is just trying to to brake. It's just trying to stop. So it's. Uh, it's doing everything it can to shed velocity while distributing that force over the most amount of surface area possible. So the um, t two of the three rear fins actuate. They're like giant wings. It actually requires an enormous amount of force to move those, to move those wings. It's sort of in the mega Newton um, class of, of, of force. Um, the, the, the third uh, fin or wing-like wing structure is actually d does not actuate, and, and it is not a vertical stabilizer as it may appear. It is actually just a leg. Um, so during the high-velocity portion of entry, it's in the lee of the wind, and um, it really doesn't have any aerodynamic purpose, and it's really just a leg. Um, it looks the same as the other ones for purposes of asymmetry. So this is a a, a true physics simulation of BFR uh, re-entering. So it, it is mostly just <clears throat> coming in like this. Um, at, at a very high angle of attack. Um, in fact, one of the things that for the general public is a tricky thing to understand is that Orbit means you are zooming around the Earth at a very high speed. Uh, people, it's slightly, it's counterintuitive where people think perhaps um, once you get to a certain altitude, gravity turns off. This is not the case. Um, in order to go up and stay up, you have to move around the Earth at approximately 25 times the speed of sound. So in fact, the space station is circling the Earth every 90 minutes. This is a very important concept to understand, that orbit is, a, is entirely about your speed horizontal to the ground or parallel to the ground. It is, it is going up and staying up is, it, the only reason you need altitude at all is to get out of atmospheric drag. So if Earth didn't have an atmosphere, you could orbit one meter or like 3.28 feet above the ground no problem. Uh, well, a little dodgy, but it's technically possible. Um, so, so yeah, if you, if you looked at that um, simulation, um, it might be worth playing that again, actually. <laughs> so you can see it's basically coming in. If, if this is the Earth, if this stage is the Earth, it's coming in like that. And, and it's just using its entire body to break. And, and it's, it's, it sort of goes like that and slows down, and, it, and then it falls like a skydiver. And, and then it rights itself, um, fires the engine, and lands on the fins. I mean, this will look really epic in person. It like, looks like guaranteed to be exciting. And you can see it's sort of falling falling body first for quite a while.
And it's re really quite, quite gentle. You're just sort of falling at terminal velocity for, for quite a long time. Very gentle fall, just sort of like floating down. And then it writes itself at the end, fires the engines and lands. It's, it's very counterintuitive. It's not like anything that people are familiar with. It's not like an airplane. Or, yeah. And then obviously, if you're landing on the moon, um, you don't need any aerodynamic surfaces at all uh, because you just, there's no, there's no air. Um, you just need thrusters. So next, the next steps with uh, BFR are, we're obviously gonna, we're going to build it, or we are building it. Uh, this is a picture of the um, main cylinder section of, of BFR. So BFR is nine meters in diameter. It's really quite enormous. You can, that, you can get a sense of scale. Like that is the, that's to scale. So that gives you a sense of, of the size of the vehicle. Quite enormous. Um, but we are, um, we're already building it. So we've built the first cylinder section. So that's the first actual cylinder section of the BFR prototype. And we'll be building the, the domes um, and the, the engine section soon. And then this is the Raptor engine. So this is the Raptor engine that will, will power BFR, both the, uh, the ship and the booster. It's the same engine. And this is a, a, approximately a 200 ton thrust engine. Uh, that's uh, aiming for uh, roughly a 300 bar or 300 atmosphere chamber pressure. Um, and depending upon, if, if you have it at a high expansion ratio, it has the potential to, be, to have an, a specific impulse above 380. Um, but it's a, and it's a stage combustion, full flow, uh, gas gas, for those who are interested in technical details. Um, like I really, this is, I'm really excited about this engine design. I think the SpaceX propulsion team has done an amazing job uh, on, on this engine design. And, and the, the SpaceX structure is an error. Like really, SpaceX team has done a phenomenal job in design of this, of this. it's like super great. Like, well done guys. I mean, but like this is, this is a stupidly hard problem. And SpaceX engineering has, I think, done a great job with this design. It's like, like I don't think most people, even in, in, the, in the aerospace industry, like, know what question to ask. Like, it took us a long time to even frame the question correctly. Like, once we could frame the question correctly, the answer was, I wouldn't say easy, but the, the answer flowed once the engine, once the question could be framed with precision, and framing that question with precision was very difficult. Oh, yeah, so this is the tra trajectory. So we'll, yeah, take off, uh, have booster separation, go into parking orbits, do a translunar injection, uh, fly around the moon, uh, and then come back and land. Yeah. That should take a few, you know, basically about four or five days. And um, be very exciting. Very exciting indeed. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do a bunch of test launches uh, w without any people on board before having people on board, to be clear. Uh, we'll, that's, it's going to be very important to test this vehicle thoroughly before putting anyone on, on board. Um, yeah, but I can't wait. Like, I'm super fired up about this. This is amazing. So <laughs> funding BFR is definitely a key question. And um, you know, that's uh, really where um, you know, we, we need to seek you know, every possible means of funding. Obviously, we've got uh, a launching of satellites. Uh, we've got servicing the space station. So we've been 
uh, transporting cargo to and from the space station for uh, several years now. Uh, and next year, we'll start transporting astronauts to and from the space station. Um, we've got the uh, Starlink um, uh, global broadband system that uh, we're developing, uh, which will also be a, a key source of revenue. But then um, if private, private customers or any, any customers for BFR are incredibly helpful uh, in funding the development of the rocket. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's where I'd like to introduce uh, the, the first uh, paying customer of BFR. So, let's see. Uh, would uh, Isaku Mizawa please come forward? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. Thank you, everyone. Wow. I am from Japan. My name is Yusaku Maezawa. You can call me MZ, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming to this conference today, and uh, thanks for watching live streaming uh, in the internet today. Yeah. Finally, I can say, I can tell you that I choose to go to the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, I can say, I'm very glad to be here, and I'm really excited and really honored. Really appreciate to be able to share with, uh, to be share this announcement with you and uh, people all over the world. Uh, before talking about the moon and this project, uh, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit, okay? Yeah. Oh, I cannot speak English very well, so please listen carefully, please. Yeah. Uh, you can see next photo. This is me. I was a state border. And uh, does anyone know where this is? No? This is Santa Monica. Yeah. Yeah. I had been here. I had been Santa Monica, Los Angeles when I was 18 years old and I was a uh, skateboarder. I was so impressed by America, uh, its fashion, music, art, and culture. And of course, nice people like you. Kind, yeah, American people is very kind, uh, yes. And uh, after six months staying here, I returned back to Japan and start, started music. Next photo, please. I played drums for the band. Our band music is so loud, so you don't have to listen to. But I was an ex-musician. And after the band, I started my own company. Please? Yes. Uh, my company is founded 20 years ago by me. So this year, my company is 20th anniversary. Woo. Thank you. And uh, finally, we started our private fashion label. Uh, that name is Zozo, Z-O-Z-O. -Z -O. And the Zozo slogan is be unique, be equal. Uh, we are all unique. At the same time, we are all equal. Uh, it's important for us, yeah. You can check our website, zozo.com, zozo.com later. Thank you. OK, uh, that's all about me. So let's move talking about the moon and this project, okay? Yeah. Now on to the main topic of the day. Many of you may be wondering, why do I want to go to the moon? What do I want to do there? And most of all, 
Why did I purchase the entire BFR? Entire BFR, very huge. For me, this project is very meaningful. I thought long and hard about how valuable it would be become the first private passenger to go to the moon. At the same time, I thought about how I can give back to the world and how this can contribute to world peace. This is my lifelong dream. Today, uh, thank you, thank you. Today, I'd like to tell you about my plans, okay? Ever since I was a kid, I have loved the moon. Just starring the moon filled my imagination. It's always there and has continued to inspire humanity. That is why I could not pass up this opportunity to see the moon up close. And at the same time, I did not want to have such a fantastic experience by myself. That would be a little lonely. I don't like being alone, so I want to share these experiences and things with as many people as possible. So that is why I choose to go to the moon. I choose to go to the moon with artists. With artists. From now, I choose to invite artists from around the world on my journey. The first artist I thought of was, do you know, Jean-Michel Basquiat, you know? As you can see, I am wearing a Comedy Garrison t-shirt featuring Jean-Michel Basquiat. He already passed away, he's a New York artist. One day, when I was staring at his painting, I thought, what if Basquiat had gone to space and had seen the moon up close or saw the Earth in full view? What wonderful masterpiece would he have created? Just thinking about it now gets my heart racing. But once I got started, I could not stop thinking about who else. What if Picasso had gone to the moon or Andy Warhol? or Michael Jackson, or John Lennon, or Coco Chanel. These are all artists that I adore. But sadly, they are no longer with us. But this is when I thought, there are so many artists with us today that I wish would create amazing works of art for humankind, for children of the next generation. And I wished very much that such artists could go to space, see the moon up close, and the earth in full view, and create works that reflect their experience. This is a project that I designed and named Dear Moon. Yeah. I'd like to introduce a detail about Dear Moon. In 2023, as the host, I'd like to invite six to eight artists from around the world to join me on this mission to the moon. These artists will be asked to create something after they return to Earth. And these masterpieces will inspire the dreamer within all of us. Needless to say, we have always been inspired by the moon. Take, for example, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, or Van Gogh's The Starry Night, and the Beatles' Mr. Moonlight. These are countless number of works that have been inspired the moon all around the world. Through the ages, the moon has filled our imagination. And with utmost love and respect for the moon, our planet's constant partner, I named this project Dear Moon. At the moment, I have not decided which artists I'd like to invite, but if possible, I'd like to reach out to top artists that represent our planet from various fields, including painters, sculptors, photographers, 
musicians, film directors, fashion designers, architects, etc. Luckily, we still have some time before 2023. So I hope to work very closely with SpaceX team and to research out to each artist personally. By the way, if you should hear from me, please say yes and accept my invitation. Please, please don't say no. Okay. In any case, there is still a lot that I cannot announce today. Sorry. So I will continue to provide regular updates. We have also created a special website for Dear Moon, which will go live after the press conference. So please take a look. Uh, domain is domain will be dearmoon.ars. Dearmoon.ars. Please check out. And I will also keep posting on my social media accounts. So please follow my accounts as well. OK, so what did you think about this project? Oh. Thank you. Thank you. I was uh, so nervous because I, uh, my English is poor. But I am glad I got through it. Thank you. And I hope my English was not too painful to, to listen to. Uh, lastly, to give you a summary of what I just tried to describe about the Dear Moon. Uh, you can see the video from now, please. It has been 50 years since Apollo 8 achieved lunar orbit in 1968. The time has come for civilians to fly to the moon. In 2023, SpaceX will launch the world's first private lunar mission with its spacecraft, BFR. The first passenger will be Japanese entrepreneur Yusaku Maezawa, a globally renowned art collector who believes art has the power to promote world peace, Maezawa made a bold decision. A painter, photographer, musician, film director, fashion designer, Maezawa will invite artists that represent Earth on his journey to the moon. The distance to the moon is 240,000 miles. The crew will spend a week in space. What will they feel when they see the moon? When they see Earth in full view? And what will they create? Their works will certainly become a legacy for humankind an awe-inspiring, global, universal art project is about to begin. Dear Moon. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Elon, and the SpaceX team for making today possible. I'm very excited. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you.
All right, so uh, can we do some Q&A? I'm not sure, sorry? Yeah. Great. How did the questions get asked? I'm not actually sure. <laughs> Hi, you guys. Ken Chang from New York Times. Oh, OK. Um, so hey, in the past two years, we've seen three designs for this rocket. And it's five years before you plan to send these people to the moon. Have you finalized this? Or are you still planning the hopper test next year? And could you sort of give more details of how you plan all these tests to be ready in 2023? Are you planning like an uncrewed mission to the moon and back? Yeah, so, um, but obviously you, you followed the, the whole progress of the design um, and indeed of SpaceX itself. Um, so you've got, you've got quite a lot of background. Um, this, I feel like this is the, the final iteration in terms of broad architectural decisions for BFR, BFS. Um, th there are a few ways to, th there's more than one way to solve this problem. Um, and the prior design, the most the iteration before this, uh, decoupled the, the landing legs from the control surfaces and had essentially six legs and, and then two actuating rear uh, flaps. Um, I actually did not like the aesthetics of that design. And so we have the, the three sort of large uh, legs uh, with two of them actuating as body flaps or large moving wings, effectively. Um, I, think, I think this design is probably on par with the other one. It might be better. Um, it's slightly riskier, technically, because of, the, of coupling legs and, and, and uh, sort of the actuating wing, wing fin flaps. But I think it's the right decision overall. I think it looks beautiful. And I, I love the Tintin rocket design. So I kind of wanted to bias it towards that. If, yeah, if in doubt, go with Tintin. Um, and then additional flights. Uh, we're going to do a lot of test flights. So we're, we still anticipate doing hopper flights next year. And then depending upon how well those go, we'll do high altitude, high, high velocity flights with the ship in um, 2020. Um, and, and also start doing tests of the, of the, the booster. And if, if things go well, we could be doing the first orbital flights in about two to three years. And then we'll do, we'll do many such test flights and, um, before putting any people on board. I'm not sure if we will actually test a flight around the moon or not, but probably we will try to do that without people before sending people. That would be wise. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, I, I'm Toshi Ogata from the Japanese newspaper called Asahi Shimbu. Um, Mr. Musk, uh, you chose a Japanese citizen for the first passenger. Is, well, he is, chose us. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, okay. But what, what's your what's your message behind behind that? You, the first passenger was a uh, Japanese citizen instead of U.S. citizen or the rest of the world. What's, and what's your message to the rest of the world through this announcement? Well, um, he uh, is, the, I think, the bravest person and the most willing to do so. And he was the, the best adventurer, I think. Um, he, he stepped forward to do it. To be clear, this is, you know, 
it's really we are honored that he would choose us. This is not us choosing him. Yeah, I would defer to comments. You know, maybe you would like to make some comments, yeah, yeah. but yeah. he's a very brave person to do this. And, and and because he is paying, you know, a lot of money. We're not disclosing the amount, but he is paying a lot of money uh, that will help with the development of this sh ship and booster, and ultimately, you know, this system, this you know, BFR system is intended to be able to carry anyone to, to orbit and, and, and to the moon and to Mars. And so he is ultimately helping pay for the average citizen to be able to um, travel to other planets. It's a great thing. Yeah. You know, I hope this is really seen as a very positive thing um, and something that people are excited about. Um, it's dangerous, to be clear. This is dangerous. This is no, you know, walk in the park here. You know, this will require a lot of training. And it's, uh, it's not again, it's like, you know, when you're pushing the frontier, it's not a sure thing. You know, it's, it's not like just taking an air flight somewhere. There's some chance that something could go wrong. You know, we'll do everything we can to minimize that. But whenever it's the first flight of, a, of something on a new technology, and we're talking about deep space, you, know, you have to be a very brave person to do that. This is not no small matter. David Curley from ABC News. Uh, two quick questions. <laughs> it's impossible to know where the mic's coming from because I see the Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. No pen. Uh, Falcon Heavy and the two deposits, the two passengers who were going to go, what happened to them? And bigger picture, what did you think when he came to you and said, I want to do an all civilian global art project and buy an entire flight to the moon? Well, it, it's, it's, it's the same person. Um, but but, but it, with, with um, Falcon Heavy and Dragon, that we would have had essentially, especially for a trip around the moon, only room for two people, because it's meant for sort of four to seven for low Earth orbit on Dragon. But it's like about the size of um, you know, an SUV inside there. Like if you have a five day, day journey in an SUV, you don't want to be jam packed. So that's why there was sort of only kind of two. Now, BFR has got room for 100, um, and we said, well, maybe it's wise on this to, to have about a dozen people or thereabouts uh, on the first trip on, in, into deep space. Um, and um, you know, he's very graciously um, offered to pr provide the, the, those seats to artists and cultural influences and like basically, you know, um, key influences in society and um, we better, make, we better get that flight right. Uh, we're going to definitely be doing everything we possibly can to, to make sure that is a good flight. Um, but instead of two, you can have a dozen. And you know, probably not wise to have 100 on, on, on this, this flight. But we're, we'll leave a lot of extra room for you know, extra fuel and oxygen, uh, you know, sort of food and water, uh, spare parts. Um, just sort of, kind of, just in case, uh, yeah, if something goes wrong, like you have as much opportunity as possible for a, a re recovery. I mean, this is like, this is a dangerous mission. <laughs> this, but it's definitely dangerous. Yep. Danger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Makoto Mitsui from the Yomiri Shimbun, uh, Japanese newspaper. Uh, I have uh, two quick questions. One goes to Mr. Maizawa and the one goes to uh, Mr. Iron. Uh, to Maizawa-san, uh, how much did you pay for the moon travel? Or how much do you plan to pay for the moon travel? And uh, uh, another question to the Iron. So what kind of SpaceX specific 
characteristics or company culture do you think has contributed to SpaceX becoming the leading company in the United States to come up with innovations such as BRF? Thank you. Sorry, I cannot answer the price co the cost today. Sorry. Well, it's going to be free for the artists. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. I think it's a really good gesture. Yeah. It's good of you to do that. Um, I, as, as far as the, you know, I think the, you know, what, what attracts uh, a lot of the best talent in the world, so the best engineers in the world, to uh, SpaceX is the nature of the mission, which is we want to advance uh, space technology to make humanity a multi-planet species. And I think that the, you know, the, the, the very best engineers in the world, uh, it's not just about a job or making a you know, salary or whatever. It's like, how is the time spent? Did it matter? What was the significance of the project? Um, this is very important, to, I think, to the best engineers. Because the best engineers, they can work anywhere. And I think the fact that we, this is a mission and we're, it's a lot of hard work, but we're trying to go about it in the right way, I think this is a, a key reason why some of the best people in the world come to work at SpaceX, and that's how we're able to make progress. Maroon jacket, right here. Hey. Hi, how are you? Um, Mireya Villarreal with CBS News. Uh, we just had a quick question. I mean, obviously we know that this, um, it, this is going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of precision. Um, in the past, we've known that there have been project deadlines that have not been met. Uh -huh. uh, for example, with the Falcon Heavy, what makes you sure, so sure that you can actually meet that 2023 deadline? No, we're, we're definitely not sure. Um, I want to be clear. Um, and I think like, we've been pretty unsure about prior dates, too. Uh, I mean, if I had some sort of crystal ball, I'd love to know, you know how long something will take. I mean, you have to like, set some kind of date that is kind of like the, the things go right date. And, and then, of course, we, do, we have reality, and things do not go right in reality. Uh, usually, there are many setbacks and issues. So you know, if we put a date out there, it's kind of like, well, if everything goes approximately right, then this is the date. But there's so many uncertainties. Um, I mean, this is a ridiculously big rocket. It's got so much advanced technology. You know, I mean, if, if it, I mean, it, it's not 100% certain that we succeed in getting this to flight. It's not even 100% certain. Like, I think it's pretty, pretty likely, but it's not certain. And, uh, yeah, but we're going to do everything humanly possible to bring it to flight as fast as, as we can um, and as safely as we can. Yeah. Hi, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Um, Elon, uh, have you made a decision on where uh, the BFR will launch and land uh, initially, and also um, for Yusaku, uh, if uh, you're not saying how much you are paying, but can you say if you've made a down payment of any kind at this point? Thank you. Yes, I did. Already. Yeah, his. Yeah, he's, he's the real deal, you know, definitely, like, he's made a significant deposit on the first, on, on the price, which is a significant price, um, and will actually have a material effect on the, um, on paying for the cost of development of BFR, like, it's a non-trivial amount that is, it's like a material impact to the BFR program, so it really, Actually, it makes a difference. This is, yeah. He puts his money where his mouth is. He's like, legit. So.
Sorry, there's another part to the question, maybe? I don't know. Yes, uh, have you selected a launch and landing site for BFR for the uh, initial flights and the first orbital flights? Thank you. Uh, we, we've not yet firmly decided on a, oh, oh I should say for, for the, the short hops, we'll be doing it out of our Texas um, site. So we have a site that um, is on the south coast of Texas uh, near Brownsville. And that's where we will be doing the initial hops of, of uh, BFS. I, I should probably, you should probably think of a different name, but it, this was like kind of the code name and it kind of stuck. Uh, but we might change that name in the future. Yeah, the only thing is like, I think we want to name like the first ship that goes to Mars after the Douglas Adams, my favorite spaceship, the Heart of Gold from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. Um, as, as for the, the first orbital flights, we have not made a firm decision on that. And it may actually be that we launch from a, a uh, floating platform. That's possible. Hi, uh, thanks for doing this. Um, you've shown us the outside of the spacecraft. Can you talk about the work that you've done so far and what the plan is for stuff that goes in it, life support, uh, interior, all the safety stuff you're going to need? And speaking of safety, you mentioned this is a very dangerous mission. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, is there any quantification you can provide to us, any sort of uh, testing you're doing to the carbon fiber body, things like that, to ensure that this can be as safe as possible? Thanks. For the, for the interior, we've, we've just have some, some sort of concepts in terms of what it would be like. And depending upon what type of mission, you'd have a different configuration. So if you were going to Mars, for example, that, you know, that's at least kind of a three-month journey, maybe upwards of a six, six or seven-month journey. So if you're going to be in something for three to six months, you want to have like a cabin and then have like a common area for recreation. and um, so some sort of meeting rooms or, you know, like, because you'll be in this thing for months. Now, if you're going, to, say, to the moon or around the moon, you kind of have a several day journey. So probably still want cabins. Yeah. Um, common area. I think you want to have like, so like a, a lot of like, like, what is the most fun that you can have in zero G? That for sure is a, uh, key thing. Fun is underrated. It's like three more of that. So, well, like, what is the most enjoyable thing we can possibly do? We will do that, I think. And then safety-wise, um, you know, this will be built upon our work with the NASA uh, crew uh, Dragon design. <clears throat> We're going to put um, more engineering effort into having a fully recyclable system for uh, for BFR, because if you have a very long journey, you, it, it makes sense to have like a if, sort of a, a, a sort of closed loop um, oxygen CO2 system, a closed loop water system. Uh, whereas if you are say just going out for several days, you don't necessarily need to have a, a fully closed loop system. So there's like a, you know, a fair bit of engineering that's needed for the Mars journey, but I think probably um, we can mostly leverage the work we've, we've done for the NASA crew mission to the, to the space station uh, for the lunar journeys. And we've, we've learned a, a great deal from, from NASA, and I really just want to, you know, just give another word of appreciation to NASA. Uh, for, for we would not be where we are today without them, and, and that um, NASA does remain our primary priority, um, along with national security space missions. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Tim Fernholtz with Quartz, over here. Uh, hey, Elon, hey, MZ. Uh, question for each of you. Uh, MZ, I'm curious if you could talk about what kind of training you expect to go uh, ahead of this uh, mission, uh, what the experience is going to be like to you and how much input you're having in that, uh, that tourist experience. 
And then Elon, I'm just curious if you can tell us uh, what uh, percentage of the company's effort or time is going to BFR right now versus other projects? And, and how important is that April 2019 commercial crew flight to making this moon mission happen? Can I answer in Japanese? まあ、その、これから全部決めますと。まだ何も決まってません。で、トレーニングもどんなことするかもまだわかりません。So nothing is written in stone, so we are going to start a discussions and decide uh, here on forward. And we haven't really discussed which what type of training we'll be doing as uh, either. All right. Um, let's see. In terms of uh, SpaceX resources, uh, this is still quite a small portion of SpaceX resources, certainly less than 5% of SpaceX, uh, less than 5% of SpaceX resources are currently spent on BFR. Um, now that will change quite significantly in the years to come, um, but overwhelmingly our resources are focused on launching satellites, uh, transporting cargo to and from the space station, and and, and then our top priority is the n upcoming NASA uh, crew mission next year. And we're, we're hoping to do a, a test flight of, of Dragon 2 um, in December. Um, and then a crewed flight um, next year, hopefully in the sort of second quarter of next year. So th that's definitely our top priority. Um, at, as we uh, complete a crew Dragon, uh, then we will shift our resources more and more to VFR. So I think, assuming that the National Crew Mission goes well, and that's, that's really quite fundamental to the, the future of SpaceX, uh, as I said, it's a top priority, then once that is, it will hopefully, if, uh, assuming that is that successful and goes well, then we probably towards the end of next year, we would switch a majority of our engineering, new engineering developments uh, towards BFR by the end of next year. Hi, this is uh, Liz Lopato with The Verge. Uh, I have two questions. I have one for the passenger and one about the rocket. Uh, my first question is, what do you look forward to most uh, while you're in space? What do you most want to do uh, while you're going around the moon? And the second is, uh, how much money is it going to take to develop the BFR to, um, to make this trip? I love art, so art to art no yugo, so artist to artist to ga collaboration shite nani ga umareru ka tiyu no meno mae de miru koto ga dekiru no ga hijou ni tanoshimi desu. So I love art, and I'm looking very much forward to seeing what uh, different artists getting together could bring to life. It's, a, it's actually hard to say what the development cost is of, of, BFR, BF, of the BFR system. I think it's the roughly, roughly $5 billion. You know, it's difficult to say what it would end up being, but that's, if I were to guess, it would be something, something like $5 billion, which would be really quite a small amount for a, a project of this nature. Like $5 billion is obviously a, a, a very, large amount of money, but, but small for a project of this nature. Yeah. Uh, last question to the LA Times. Hi, Samantha Mastanaga, LA Times. Um, one question for Elon, you mentioned um, the various revenue streams that uh, you're planning to use to pay for BFR development. What's your estimate of the development costs for BFR? Sorry, the oh, uh, what's your estimate of uh, development costs for BFR? Oh, that's what I was talking about. Is uh, for, for the for this BFR system, I, I think it's probably on the order of five billion dollars, um, something like that. I don't think it's more than ten, and I don't think it's like less than two. Do a few more questions if there's, yeah. I want to make sure if like if you 
you know, um, made your way out here and you, you feel like there's an important question that we have an, uh, you know, we definitely try to do our best to answer it. Uh, Elon. Ed and by the way, thanks guys for coming out here. It was, it was good to see you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. uh, Elon, Ed Ludlow from Bloomberg Television, thank hey. you for the event. Uh, I have a question about lunar landing and trips to the surface because you outlined your vision for multi-planet species, the future of the human race. Is that something concrete in the near term as a stepping stone or a way to drive uh, additional revenue? And for the passenger, have you spoken to any of your billionaire friends, any of your high net worth friends? to either convince them of your vision to join you on BFR or to answer Elon's plea for funding for more BFR. If you could answer that, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Well, I think it'd be very exciting to have a moon base. I used to watch this like corny show called like Moon Base Alpha. <laughs> it's like made no sense, but it was cool. Like there was a base on the moon. Like we should have a base on the moon. Like, why do we, it's 2018, why is there no base on the damn moon? There should be one. And, and we should go there a lot. <laughs> you know, I think that would be amazing to, to have a base on the moon. Particularly if it was like something where like the average person, if they saved up, could go. That would be incredible. And that's like the kind of thing we want to do. Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, BFR is designed to land on any surface in the solar system, uh, whether there's air or not. That's why it's important to have a propulsive, propulsive landing system. Um, you know, like, wings and landing gear work great on Earth, but they kind of need an atmosphere and a, and a runway. You know, and like, how's, who's going to build that runway? How do you get... begs the question. Like, somebody's going to build the runway. Also, there's no air on the moon, but tricky to land with wings. So propulsive landing is the way to go. It's like actually the only way to go really. You could try to use a, like a, if you had a school payload, like try to sort of bounce, you know, like that was like one of the Mars missions, like you had like a inflatable kind of like bouncy castle thing. But I don't think that's like uh, gonna sell well. So propulsive landing is the way to go. And this is designed for propulsive landing and the, the fins are designed to deal with a wide range of atmospheric conditions. So it, it could, you know, land on a, on, well, another, in theory, another planet with atmosphere. You wouldn't want to land on Venus, though. Um, yeah, it's kind of like Mars and Earth, pretty much, that have an atmosphere. Everything else is uh, either not relevant in, in its atmosphere or it's like a gas giant or something like that. So. You really want propulsive landing, and then you use, the atmos use an atmosphere if it's helpful for braking, but you don't require it. Yeah. But like, we want like, it'd be great if there was regularly scheduled flights to the moon. I mean, that's, that's a great future. That's a great future. Yeah. Thank you, Elon. Eric Johnson with Reuters News. Um, if you, let's say you hit your 2023 goal and you just talked about, you know, regular lunar trips, can you talk about what your goal is for annual, an annual ramp up of how many trips you'd like to see? That's question one. That's question uh -huh. one. And then the second part is, uh, sorry, is uh, Boeing CEO has said that the first humans will go to Mars on a Boeing rocket. What uh, is game on. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, That's what I want to ask you is given the increased competition, good. what do you have a, to say to that? Thank you so much. Let's, I say like, yeah, good. That's like, I'm glad you said that. That's great. We should do it. Like, I mean, I mean, it, like competition is a good thing. It's like uh, races are interesting. I say like, I'm glad, I hope Boeing really goes like hardcore for Moon and and Mars missions, yeah, that'd be really great. Um, as far as the ramp up, it's like as fast as we can make it go, we'll make it go. Um, I mean, we're pedal to the metal. We just need to make sure we have our priorities right. And like our priority is, you know, uh, the NASA, you know, crewed mission, 
our satellite customers. Those are our current priorities. And once we are confident that that is taken care of, then we will ramp up BFR big time, get the Starlink system active. Yeah, you know, hopefully that that does the trick. And it'd be great at Boeing like this, really good at making airplanes. So maybe they can be really good at making rockets too. That's great. Hey, Elon. Uh, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut here. Uh, I see that you changed the engine configuration for the BFS. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, is there still engine out capability? You know, is it vacuum optimized but still landable on sea level? Can they function as an abort system? Can you just kind of tell us about your new decision making on that? Oh, yeah. Actually, you noticed that uh, that's a good thing to notice. Uh, um, good eye. Um, so, in order to um, minimize the development risk and, and cost, we decided to commonize the engine between the booster and the ship. So, um, like, a, a future upgrade path for BFS would be to have a vacuum optimized nozzle. So th these are sort of, these, these nozzles are kind of a, you know, kind of a sea level nozzle, size nozzle. So they, they are able to operate well at sea level because they're, made, they're, they're essentially the, the booster, booster size nozzle. Um, like where you see those, those, the, that sort of cargo around the perimeter, um, you can actually switch out those cargo sections for a, a vacuum nozzle version of, of Raptor. So, and, and it can go all the way to, the, the vacuum nozzle can go all the way to the perimeter of the, to, all the way to the, basically the, 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 the skin of the, the vehicle. So you can have like quite, you can have something with, with, which has maybe three, three or four times the uh, exit diameter of the, of the Raptors that you see there. Um, as engines in, the, in, engines in the perimeter, and the exchange would be that you'd lose basically two of those cargo racks in exchange for every vacuum engine, but then your, your total payload performance to Mars would increase significantly. But we can do the 100 tons to the surface of Mars with those engines. Uh, but it would definitely, I think, like version two would, would have the vacuum engines most likely in, in place of those cargo racks. Yeah, but the, the Having having those uh, um, the engines in that, in that configuration, you know, with, with with seven engines means it's definitely capable of engine out at any time, and in, including two engine out in in almost all circumstances. So you could lose two engines and still be totally safe. In fact, in some cases you can lose up to four engines and still be totally fine. So it, it only needs three engines for landing. Three out of seven. Yeah. Uh, Ivan Kouran of uh, Agence France Press. Mr. Maezawa, have you thought about how you're going to select the artist? And Mr. Mas, can you give us uh, an idea of whether Mr. Maezawa contributed more or less than 5% of the <laughs> development cost? <laughs> ah, in principle, I would like to reach out to the artist that I love. And I'm happy with just 5%. Thank you very much for working on the rocket. Enough. Thank you. Well, I don't think we're going to, like, obviously do any, like, percentage math. I would kind of give it away, you know. Um, <laughs> but but it's, it's, material, it's a material percentage. Material percentage. Hi, Elon. Robert Perlman with CollectSpace and Space.com. Okay. Sorry, it's like almost impossible to see what's going on. Okay. Um, you showed a trajectory screen before. For this flight, can you talk a little bit about the profile, maximum G um, that the passengers will experience? How long will, we, will they be at the moon? And um, how close will they be above the surface? Well, it's important to bear in mind that like, we, can, we can actually adjust the maximum Gs um, at the, we're, in exchange for a reduction in payload. So 
this is a mission we could probably do on in the ascent phase, keeping it under under a three G ascent. Although you know normally you'd probably want to go to five Gs, but under three Gs, maybe even like two two and a half, because we'd have a lot of lot, a lot of extra payload. Um, and then it, it it is this mission would be a loop around the moon. It, the exact mission profile has not been decided, but I think it would be pretty exciting to kind of like skim the surface, go real close, and then zoom out far, and then come back around. So in the diagram, it looks kind of symmetric, but I think you'd probably want to go real close, and then go zooming past the moon, go, go far out, kind of get about as far from Earth as you can get within reason. So like, yeah, like even the moon's relatively small, and you come zipping back in. And, and then if we do, um, we, we, you, we could do sort of like two, uh, like an initial atmospheric, there are like two ways to do it. You could either go come straight in, which would be a relatively high G situation. That might be like maybe a 6G entry or something like that. Um, or you could do one where you skim the atmosphere and, do, and, and shed velocity and, and then capture into low Earth orbit and then do a deorbit burn and, and come in, in which case you could probably keep the entry Gs hopefully to around three. This is sort of pretty off the cuff here, but th those are kind of, I think, close-ish numbers. Yeah. Uh, this is the last question. Michael Sheets with CNBC. Elon, you're standing next to the first real person who's putting money behind a project of putting people into space. What does that make you think about going into space yourself, and when do you think that's going to happen? You mean like me personally? Oh, uh, well, I think first of all, like I would say, I mean, he, I think this is like done a lot to restore my faith in humanity that somebody is willing to do this, like, you know, to take their money and like help fund this new project that's risky might not succeed, it's dangerous. It's like donating seats, like these are great things. It's like, I tell you, it's done a lot to restore my faith in humanity. And as far as me, me going, I'm not sure. He, he did suggest like maybe that I would join on this trip. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Please, please. Maybe we'll both maybe we'll both be on it. Yeah. All right. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's very exciting. It's guaranteed to be a really exciting journey, and we'll keep you posted along the way. Um, yeah. I mean, I hope you're fired up. I'm super fired up. This is going to be great. Thank you.